Hello, I'm Dr. John Picton, and in this equity short, I'm talking about uh, special commissioners of income tax and Pemsel, a case from 1891. The case is famous, this House of Lords case is famous, uh, because of Lord McNaughton's definition of charity in the case, uh, which uh, for a very long time uh, was the touch point for the definition of charity in England and Wales, and actually remains the touch point of the definition of charity in many jurisdictions around the world. That definition, that definition of charity, is uh, purposes which are uh, for the relief of poverty, that's important, but also the advancement of education, the advancement of religion, and this broad catch or had any other purpose beneficial to the community. In this short, I'm going to talk about the legacy of that definition, but also perhaps the wider legacy of the case, which has been forgotten. The case needs to be set in the context of its time. It related to an endowment of lands uh, by Mary Elizabeth Bates. Uh, she must have been very wealthy. She left a, a gift during life in 1813, but very little is known about her. Uh, she was a Moravian, that is a Protestant dissenter, and she's buried in Grace Hill in Northern Ireland. There's a picture of the graveyard where she's buried. Uh, and she set up a Moravian mission to spread the gospel around the world. This mission had been established for a long time before 1891, when it came uh, within the radar of the tax commissioners. Those tax commissioners at that time were based in Somerset House in London. And they had a piece of legislation to apply, the Income Tax Act 1842, and that gave allowances of income tax to endowments of the type established by Mary Bates, so long as they serve charitable purposes. And put simply, what the tax commissioners argued is that the endowment, the Moravian mission, didn't serve charitable purposes within the definition of the act because it didn't relieve poverty. The tax commissioners must have thought they had a very strong case. This was a case, as I say, that went to the House of Lords. And the reason they must have felt they had a very strong case and the wind was in their sails is that just the year before, uh, uh, well, two years before, the, in Scotland, precisely the same piece of legislation um, um, and the definition of charitable purposes had been considered and it had been held in the trustees of the Baird Trust and Lord Advocate, it had been held that this meaning of charitable purposes, this statutory language, required the relief of poverty in order for an endowment to get its tax allowances. So they must have felt the wind was in their sails. The tax commissioners lost and the Moravians won. James Pemsel was the treasurer of the Moravians in England. James Pemsel won, but it was a close run thing. The House of Lords was split. And in the minority, uh, Lord Halsbury uh, said, I conceive that the real ordinary use of the word charitable as distinguished from any technicalities whatsoever always does involve the relief of poverty. And so there he's siding with, in the minority, he's siding with the tax commissioners. He's saying that the Moravians uh, and their mission, because they were not for the relief of poverty, uh, were not serving charitable purposes, and therefore they couldn't have their tax allowances under the 1842 Act. The majority though, and Lord McNutton, held that the relief of poverty was not central to this uh, expression charitable purposes in the legislation. Lord McNutton said, I'm not sure there is a word which more unmistakably has a technical meaning in the stricter sense of the term. That is a meaning clear and distinct 
peculiar to the law as understood and administered in this country and not depending upon or coterminous with the popular or vulgar use of the word. So for him, the word charitable purposes in the legislation uh, imported a technical meaning developed by judges which didn't involve the relief of poverty. Because in equity, the definition of charity over many generations had been developed so that it was much broader than just the relief of poverty. And so what Lord Matten essentially did is imported into the tax legislation the judicial case law, the judicial meaning of charity, and made the tax legislation and the judicial case law one of the same in relation to the definition of charity. And so it was a tax case. But it's not necessarily remembered as such. We'll come back to that in a moment. It's remembered for the definition of charity put forward by Lord McNaughton. I won't read it all out again. Pause the screen if you want to read it. Suffice to say, if you look at the bottom quotation there, Lord McNaughton wasn't entirely original. Samuel Romilly, arguing before Lord Eldon, had put forward a very similarly worded definition uh, in 1804. Uh, so very many decades uh, before the 1891 case. The legacy of the definition, though, uh, perhaps lies in the very broad forth head, other purposes beneficial to the community, because that's being very, very broad, has encouraged a great deal of litigation, as a very large number of organisations have claimed that they're for the benefit of the community and therefore charitable. So perhaps one legacy of the case is an awful lot of case law and an awful lot of disputes in court. Staying with the legacy of the, that definition, Although it's been replaced in England and Wales, the definition has been replaced by a statutory definition, its replacement is only partial because you can see the definition submerged, a kind of ghost of the definition uh, within that uh, statutory list. The Charities Act 2011, section three, subsection one. Well, the first three uh, purposes uh, in the list are the prevention or relief of poverty, the advancement of education and the advancement of religion. That is Lord McNaughton's definition. And then a big list of purposes which look well like any other purpose beneficial to the community. And so the ghost of the case lives on in the legislation. But one major legacy and the most socially interesting legacy uh, relates to this separation for the purposes of tax legislation between the natural meaning of the word charity and those charities which enjoy charitable status and therefore tax advantages. Put another way, organisations that in no way accord with the ordinary language, the popular, the democratic meaning of the word charity for the purposes of tax legislation following this case have always been advantaged. So Nuffield Health that runs uh, gyms, provides no special discounts um, and uh, is a valid charity. The public school sector, there's a picture of Dulwich College, uh, is a valid charity. And British Cryogenics Council, which freezes people after death, is a valid charity for tax purposes. Because for tax purposes and the purposes of tax legislation, the natural and ordinary meaning of the word charity isn't relevant. What's relevant is the judicial technical meaning of charity and that is perhaps the most socially significant legacy of the case.